In the matter of resolution determining the necessity of the submission to the electors of the question of levying a tax regarding children's services. Um, this is one of the reasons I was hoping we could be live today, but unfortunately um, it's not the case. So once again, we will be monitoring for questions. Uh, this resolution is determining the necessity um, of a tax levy uh, for the CPS. Um, it's been very uh, public um, over the past year in terms of the, the struggle that CPS has been going through in terms of the, the amount of kids in care, amount of kids in custody, and what that cost truly does uh, to the county and to their budget. Uh, we saw last year all of their reserves depleted, roughly $2 million depleted uh, from the start of last year. Uh, I know Director Mantel had been talking about a potential levy now for probably a year and a half or so. Um, you know, we are now officially combined, and I want to be clear that as of July 1. So while the, the board made, this board made the decision to restructure the CPS board, and CPS board agreed to that, there was still very much a, what's called a three month transition period where all the legal had to happen, or all the financial had to happen, or everything had to happen for it to be rolled up under um, JFS. Uh, I know Tammy and Jason's been doing a ton of work um, with statewide JFS, statewide fiscal, to figure out what is this, uh, what does it look like. Um, currently, our revenue for CPS uh, it is adequate for about 130, is that the right number? About 130 kids. Uh, we'll get an update on what our numbers here in just a second. Um, there are things we're fixing. Um, and prosecutor team and thank you for being here as well um, we know the system is, is strained but there's also opportunity for improvement um, I will say over the past couple months I, I've been encouraged by the collaboration between uh, CPS JFS the prosecutor's office uh, the judge judge lemons um, because I, I don't think a lot of people truly understand that this is a this process touches multiple areas and if one area is is in a backlog or another area is moving like it kind of slows down the whole system so the collaboration and the communication um, over the past several months has been encouraging and i know I, that'll continue uh, they're working closely together for scheduling purposes to kind of get kids through the system when it needs to happen but no longer but also no longer than it should take so um, what we are looking at today is a, uh, a renewal, a replacement rather, replacement of the current levy at the, um, the 2016 evaluation, I believe, and then also an additional two mil uh, levy to be considered. Um, this is a, that number is a little bit better than the first number we were hit with, which was about 3.5 mil. Um, but it's still an increase, and we're still very mindful of what that does to the taxpayers. And, you know, it is, it is important for them to know what we've done, where we're at, and really where we hope to be. So um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over um, to Director uh, Moore Morton um, to talk kind of what the, that JFS combination has looked like. Uh, and I'm sure she'll turn it over to Director Mantel and then Shane, uh, Director the Prosecutor Team, and if you can add kind of what your office has been doing to this point and what the next rest of the year looks like. Sure. Thank you, Chair. It's, uh, it's been a heavy lift. Um, we are doing it with grateful hearts. We know that this is the right thing at the right time for the right reason. So uh, we will see uh, good things come. But uh, right now it's a little bumpy, but we're putting every effort forth uh, to make it as positive of a transition as we can. So now officially SIOTA JFS is a triple combined agency uh, having public assistance, child support, and children's services. So that's, uh, un that is new for, for us. Our two bargaining units have merged. Uh, you guys approved that just a few minutes ago. So we are working uh, diligently with the um, leadership from the unions uh, and working on policies and procedures that have to change as a result of the different operations that Children's Services brings into uh, the JFS world. So we're working through labor management meetings and, and having really good conversations and communication working through that. It's a process, so it'll take a while. 
Um, we are in the middle of combining the finance and operations uh, and will physically move uh, Children's Services into the JFS structure later this fall. We don't have an official date on that yet, but we're going to work toward making that happen as soon as we can. Uh, there's a lot involved. <clears throat> um, state fiscal, as you mentioned, has been helping us with the financial transition. Uh, there's a lot involved with that. But what that brings me to is to uh, talk about the reason for this uh, resolution of necessity. Our current levy <clears throat> provides around $1.2 million annually for children's services. Um, and we receive around $2 million uh, from state and federal funding. So that gives children's services specifically, not JFS, but children's services specifically about uh, $3.2 million to operate. Sadly, <clears throat> we are projecting $5.8 million in foster care placement costs alone this year. So with a $3.2 million budget to operate, and we've got a $5.8 million foster care placement expense in front of us, we're in a shortfall. So uh, it doesn't take that doesn't take into account any of the operational costs, that $5.8 million for foster placement. So it's a nearly a $3 million shortfall. Uh, that's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> and that's nothing that you can pick up here and place here. I mean, that's pretty significant. So uh, the shortfall currently is being covered by you all uh, using the ARPA funds, and then ultimately it would come out of the general fund. So that is not something that can be sustained long term. So that is why we're going to have to ask for this additional levy to cover these costs and um, certainly not something anybody wants to do, but we feel it's very necessary for us to be able to operate and keep children safe and continue to do what we're doing and improve things. The financial piece to where we are right now. Uh, and I know there was, uh, there's always a question about total number of children in care and, and where we are uh, with that. So we, we have had a slight reduction in the last couple of months. Um, again, we're not where we'd like to be. We do have multiple crises in our community that, that do require us to remove more children than we would like to. Um, but currently we have 365 children in, in care. Um, 29 of those are in permanent custody, which means we are the custodians for those 29 children. And then uh, there are 336 in temporary custody. Um, so that is a reduction. We're, we are uh, at a reduction of about 30 from our highest point, um, which I think prosecutor may speak a little more about the terminations and um, you know his, his group and, and the two dedicated um, assistant prosecutors to, to our um, to our team are working diligently. We also have, uh, we still have, uh, for at least a little while, our own attorney um, for a few more months, uh, which is also assisting in that process. Um, obviously our numbers are large. They are larger than most any area. Uh, as I've shared with the commissioners, um, Scioto and Adams County Children's Services bounce back and forth for the highest number of children um, as far as um, comparatively per thousand uh, in the state of Ohio. And it's not, it's not any secret that we're neighbors uh, and we share a lot of the same problems. Um, so again, I, I want to be fair. We're not the only ones experiencing this, but you know, we here today are responsible for this county. Um, we we have made some steps to make some improvements, as Tammy mentioned. Um, that was part of the reason of the combination. Before the combination and through the combination, um, we did we do have an MOU memorandum memorandum excuse me of understanding with Wendy's wonderful kids and that is at no cost to the county that is at no cost to the taxpayers so when these wonderful kids um, provides opportunities for such for people like us for uh, agencies like ours to receive free assistance for adoption of children uh, they focus more on teenagers as you know statistically and historically teenagers it's a little bit tougher to get uh, have those children adopted so they focus on the older population um, so we are working through that right now and, and that is again that is a free service and uh, and our we have a team dedicated to working with them 
We also have an MOU with our local community action, um, which we have signed and agreed to. Um, Luann Valentine is, is really doing a great job, and Steve Sturgill uh, being willing to work with us. So they're, they are in, at this point, we're aiming for mid-August. Uh, CAO at no cost, again, to taxpayers or the commissioners or the county uh, is going, this is grant funded. They're going to be uh, providing us two case aids. Now, they can't do everything that a case worker can do, but what they can do is take a lot of the agency uh, visitation time away and allow our case workers to spend more time in the field. Uh, so that's number one. We want to be able to better serve our community and our partners. But number two, it ultimately, we hope, as Tammy and I have discussed, it'll be a cost savings because it can reduce overtime. Because right now, um, you know, our case workers, uh, every, every case worker we have is, is above the state best practice uh, recommendation for caseload. Uh, most of them are twice as many as they should have. Uh, the state recommendation for a caseworker in the ongoing department, which works with families from a few months to years, um, is 12 to 15. Uh, many of our, our caseworkers are at 30, 28, 32, and that's just the number of cases. That's not number of children. Um, you know, at one time during you know, this situation and the time I've been there, we had one caseworker who had 71 children on there. Uh, and again, there was nowhere for those children to go because of the cases, uh, the caseload of other children, or excuse me, of other caseworkers. So we are working with partners, local and state and federal when we can, to do things at a cost savings. Um, I, I think, you know, we are headed in a positive direction with this merge. Um, obviously, we work with law enforcement and the sheriffs here today um, to try to work together. If we can avoid removal safely, we will. But if there's no other option or if it is in the best interest of that child and that family, then we're going to remove. And, I, you know, I know one thing Commissioner Davis and I spoke about, I think, probably my first month on the job was, was take a look at how we handle things. Are we being, are we handling it appropriately? And I know we've talked about the word aggressive. Um, you know, we remove at a rate that is in, in many months more aggressive than any, anyone. And, and I want to, I want to, I want everyone to understand is aggressive doesn't mean careless and reckless. It's appropriate. When there is some middle ground, we lean toward the safety of the child and we remove. And that doesn't always make everyone happy and we realize that. And when we don't remove, we also understand that we frustrate certain people. Um, there is no perfect formula. Um, but with all of that, I do think we're on the right track. It is going to take, um, you know, a financial boost from somewhere. Uh, and as you all have discussed and as we have discussed, there are very few avenues for agencies like ours to find funding. Um, and so that's why, <clears throat> obviously, we're here today. So um, with that, I don't know if you do want to hear from Prosecutor Tiemann or... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to add uh, my two cents to this. Uh, as you know, uh, Side County Prosecutor's Office uh, took over representation of Children's Services um, about a year ago, give or take, uh, through the, the uh, former board. And uh, so we started uh, getting the systems in place and designing the processes and the, and the uh, personnel to uh, effectively do that. We wanted a more encompassing representation for, for that organization and in whatever form it, it may take. And, and now we're under JFS, which um, there are great people on that board, as we all agree. Um, but I think uh, the board situation, as the state has leaned, is a little clunky. And, and now we're under JFS. And uh, we are in that transition phase where hopefully um, those things that can be remedied by the, the, the streamlining of the agency will be remedied. Uh, we have, for every child that is in custody, that is a case we have. And my people know that they need to consider that case a child. And that's how they think of it. And, and so uh, it quickly became apparent to me that uh, one full-time attorney uh, would not be able to handle the rigors of the due diligence required to do these cases professionally and competently. Uh, so we hired uh, an additional um, prosecutor as well as a paralegal and secretary. So uh, the first thing was getting acclimated and, and there's so many different facets to a child's case when they're in children's services. There's emergency removals, there's initial safety plans if we can avoid removal, uh, there's case plans that are developed, there's getting the services set up for the parents 
And then ultimately we have this category later on when the kids are uh, safe in children's services custody, which is something we have improved upon as well over the last couple of years. Uh, when they're safe in children's services custody, there's an end game. And one of the concerns you rightfully have as a board is the cost associated with placement. Logically, the longer children are in custody, the more costs there are. Uh, so uh, one, of the, one of the limitations that the private attorney situation had was a limitation on the hours and resources that they could apply towards that. Uh, when you are removing children, uh, unfortunately, times left and right because of the opioid epidemic and, and all the big city issues we have in our small county town, um, that, uh, that, that overwhelms and you have to prioritize removing um, those children from those dangerous situations, the immediate danger, before you can look at, okay, how do we transition this kid out of foster care? How do we, how do we prepare them to be adults? And, and so that created, unfortunately, a backlog of around 100 cases past the two-year mark. Under Ohio law, if a child has been in custody for 12 out of 24 months, you start looking at some kind of permanency plan for that child, whether that be finding some other legal custodian, whether that be an adoption process, whether that be, okay, he or she is 16, we're gonna start educating them on how to be an adult. And, and so those are all different things that the caseworkers and, and their collateral services in, in, the, in the community have to, to go through and work through, and in the court system they have to go through and work through. But there's an opportunity there to make sure we're doing everything we can uh, to, to be in the best interest of the children, but at the same time, reduce those costs. And, and certainly, if, if we're going to go to the voters of Sida County, they need to be assured that we are doing everything we can in a responsible manner to keep the costs right where they need to be. Um, and so uh, one of the things we've started focusing on is, is that backlog. And I've, and I've got some numbers, if, if, if you can. Yeah, love to hear. Uh, so when we, when, when we took over, and um, Judge Lemons was instrumental in all this too, he's been part of these conversations, and uh, there were, uh, with the agency, approximately uh, 89 children that were post-24 months, which means um, there should be some kind of action in court to get these children where they need to be. Uh, what, again, whether that's legal custody, whether that's adoption, whether that's permanency plan, some of those are soft cost savings, some of those will remain in the custody of children's services, whatever's in the best interest of the kid. Uh, but as we went through that list, we've worked with um, uh, Mr. Mantell and his folks and, and Ms. Moore, and we've gone through each name on that list, each kid on that list. We've poured through that. Uh, right away, we noticed there were 16 of that 89 that had already been taken care of. So, so that, that was good to get that head start on that list. Um, and in the last uh, 24 months, actually probably more towards the last few months, uh, we've really started hitting that pretty hard. Uh, so 16 were off the list. 16 of that total past 24 have been resolved in one way or another, um, whether that be uh, a legal custody where we find a private individual uh, who says, I want custody of these children, I want to raise these children, and, and we do the paperwork and we work through the court to get them uh, placed out of the custody and the care and cost of children's services. We have five in the court. So we're in court now in 36 additional cases, whether that's um, legal custody to a private individual or getting through the hearing process or a permanent custody filing, uh, those types of things. And then there are 21 more uh, that we're working to get the paperwork ready to get into court um, uh, this year. My, my goal is to have that backlog caught up by January 1. Um, it's a lofty goal. These cases are not, you know, if everybody agreed on what should happen and what's in the best interest, these cases would flow pretty quickly. But you have to protect the due process rights and the fundamental rights as a parent um, to, to, to rear your children. Um, they have to have hearings. They can have attorneys. Um, you have guardian ad litem and CASAs that make a recommendation. You have the agency itself that's worked with these kids in the case plan to say this is what they think. And then ultimately the judge has to decide. And when you put more than one person in a room, there's going to be disagreement and, dis and discourse has to happen. So, um, so these aren't cases that 
we can say, okay, we've got these 36 filed, and they're going to be done by this day. That, that's just not how the justice system uh, is set up to work. And we all understand that, but it's worth saying. Uh, so that's the goal with that. Additionally, we are trying to address those that haven't gotten to the 24-month uh, yet, the 12 to 24 months. We want to make sure that we're not waiting until 24 months to address these cases. If at 12 months it becomes apparent that we need to do something, uh, put these kids on a different direction. Maybe the parents need a few more months and everything will be fine and we can reunify. I mean, ultimately, if the parents do what they need to do to become better parents, that's what we want to do. Uh, but there's other legal custodies, permanent custodies we can look to file earlier, which will also reduce the cost. Uh, with the caveat, what do we need to do to protect the children and what's in their best interest? Uh, so in that category, um, we have um, 17 legal custody motions have been filed, um, seven permanent custody motions have been filed, um, nine have been resolved, for instance, return of their parents, uh, that kind of thing, and then 27 are left to um, look at what the next step is in filing. So we're, we're cutting down that list as well. Um, so. The goal is by next year, um, the cost associated with the delays is reduced. And that's 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 it. Unless you have any questions. Sir. Questions, questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, I do have general questions. Sure. Not uh, just to Mr. I'll just thank you, uh, all three. Uh, clearly, you guys are. Communications flowing, everybody's working together and, and understands the magnitude, truly what we're dealing with here, not just from a financial standpoint, but from an emotional, social aspect of kids being in care too long. Um, and the uh, you know, prosecutor team, I like the laser focus of, hey, 24 is not the, not the standard. It's, you know, making sure we're closer in line to that 12 and uh, 24. So thank you for that. Um, this time, any additional comments, questions? Yeah, <clears throat> if I could, I, I really want to draw out a couple things that you uh, each said during your uh, discussion there. Um, the comment that was made was um, the current funding, and this is important because I, I really, this is going to be a topic of great debate in our community. It will be. Um, you know, when we're doing a, an additional two on top of a one, and which will be a total of three, um, you know, just to give everyone an idea of what that looks like, and we'll be doing more and more of that as far as communicating what the cost is uh, per 100000 valuation to the voters. But uh, you know, DD is sitting at a seven mil, I think it is. So to you know, equally, um, you know, I, I think those populations are equally vulnerable and, and important to our community. So that may give everybody an idea of what that looks like as far as valuation or what that could mean. Um, but the comment was made about our current, and I think, uh, Ms. Morton, you made a comment about our current funding level is sufficient for 130 kids. Do the math, everyone. Yes, please, and that's why I'm asking is for you you to discuss this. Please do, yes, and Ryan, if you could, and we'll probably be doing some of this because I really sure. want to bring some of this out for everyone who sees this because my, my, my concern is is that if we don't put out this information right now and really clarify that it'll, it'll cause, there will be some people who will just go out and start saying things and not knowing or not really understanding the facts. And I think it's important that we get this right, right off the bat. And then we'll start sharing more and more and more. But go right ahead, I'm sorry. No. So to Tammy's point, and I think Commissioner Powell brought it up, uh, excuse me, Chairman Powell brought it up, that 130, and that is what we would consider, what I would refer to as standard care. So a child that does not require any excessive medical care or um, any type of inpatient, outpatient, consistent. Unruly. Unru so yeah, right. transportation, for instance. So we're talking about 130 at a very standard care 
and I don't like to use the word typical rate because Basically. each entity has their own rate, but in our region, the rates are similar um, when we're talking about standard foster care. So um, we do have, you know, you mentioned DD, we have, they've been a good partner on sharing some costs on children who we, who we share services with. So I, I want to be clear that 130, that is 130 children who would require what I think most of us would understand is standard typical care that you think of when you want to raise a child, clothing and food, um, basic necessities, you know, what that may cost the household um, for utilities, that kind of thing. So a very standard rate of care. So we're not, we are not talking about children um, because again, every child who comes to us has experienced trauma, but there are levels of trauma as we are all aware. We're not talking about, uh, again, long-term facility care uh, again, that could be mental health, physical health, emotional health, that could be behavioral situations. So, you know, those, those types of care are extremely expensive. Um, and again, I want to be clear, I'm not, I, I just, I want the community to understand that all of these children we treat as an individual child, you know, to the prosecutor's point, but some children need more excessive and extensive care than others. So I, I want that to be clear. Do you think, do you think the level of trauma to these children has increased i have i just okay i've been here two two years so 24 months um in the 24 months i have i have been here i would say that's an accurate statement that it has increased in the time i've been here. now we have people who have been in this world for a long time obviously you know i spent 20 years in public education so i am aware and work with some of the children who who sure. we have in care so Commissioner, I, I think that's an accurate statement, and it, there doesn't seem to be a sign of that trauma decreasing in, in the near future. If you don't mind, I, I noticed in Hamilton County, Cincinnati proper, did a levy increase. I think it was on the last November uh, general election. I, I know they, or it's on this one. I think it, it's on this one. It, They're asking for an increase, and their reasons, two reasons specifically was, additional children okay i mean they've got an influx of children which it was spoken by someone about this is a statewide issue we are we are seeing this everywhere um and the level of trauma that they're seeing the increase in trauma which is causing some of the additional expenditures that we're seeing um you know that that, and that's what they're saying on their their levy increases because they're just inundated with with this so, so to to your point um, I again we for a variety of reasons we can't give specific information about about sure. cases sure but I had uh, a meeting I had with one of our um, administrative team yesterday one of our supervisors to your point we we children who we have in, in our care for whatever reason once they once they start working with our staff and start working with counselors, we are then discovering, and this, this again, this happened less than 24 hours ago, I was informed of a couple of, of situations where we're discovering trauma that we didn't know about and that had not been reported to us previously, but now we're learning from the child because they feel safe enough to, to speak to the, their, their placement. So not only are we removing for the initial trauma that we're aware of, we're then finding, to your point, increased situations and increased trauma that these children have locked away and you know it, it, it's that that's that's very you know again it's just a little ironic you brought that up but yes we I just had to sit down with our investigative supervisor yesterday and he said hey we you need to be aware of, of this this and this because now we have additional issues on these cases and I you know it's, it's hard to see I mean you know it's, it's hard to watch it, it, it's hard to, to know but you know there's a group that you always hear people say, well, someone has to deal with it. Well, the, the some ones are here and the some ones are out right. in the field right now. Right. Um, and it's, it's not easy. Um, and I, you know, this is, none of this is exaggerated. I do appreciate each one of you being here. I know the Sheriff just had to step out for a second. Um, as I mentioned, this is a statewide issue. Uh, this has been brought up. As a matter of fact, there was a, uh, a very uh, impromptu discussion with the governor a few weeks ago. Uh, in one of our county commissioner association meetings, we are not the only ones dealing with this in any, I mean, it, it is everywhere. Um, and one of the discussions, well, one of the discussion points was, is uh, the, 
the increase, the, the fact that the opioid epidemic is so profound and so huge now, um, and large, it's not just large cities, it's, it's now in the rural counties, it really is. And the comment that was made, I brought it up to the governor, I think it really opened some eyes. That, um, there was, and there was other county commissioners that really supported what was said. Was the introduction of fentanyl, and, and, and prosecutor team, and you could probably speak to this, I, I know the sheriff, I'm sorry, he had to step out for a second. But the introduction of fentanyl seems to have really amped this up. That, uh, and one of the concerns in relation to CPS is that we're hearing from clinicians, people that are actually dealing on the recovery side with fentanyl exposure, where, where they're using fentanyl, and you know, everything's being cut with fentanyl, it seems like, and maybe you can speak more to that, uh, prosecutor. But that the recovery time in regards to fentanyl is longer, or in some cases non-existent, that people are really struggling with that, getting over fentanyl and that the correlation to CPS and in the case of parents who are addicted and lose their children into TC, temporary custody, that that 24 months isn't happening. It's just not happening. And there's a concern that, yeah, we can do drug courts. Yes, we can invest in that. Yes, we can spend all of these millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, in Ohio on recovery, but that's not going to solve our children's issue. That that the time frame is longer, and therefore we have children languishing in temporary custody that should be moved to permanent custody quicker as a result of the fact that their parents aren't going to recover in an acceptable amount of time. Would you like to comment on that or, or prescript team? I, I just have one more point really. You would brought up Hamilton County, and obviously that's not a technical neighboring county, but it's, it's close. It's sure. regional. Um, you know, I, I mentioned Adams County. Um, Adams County did did run and successfully pass a children's services levy, I believe, a year and a half ago. Um, I know it's been within my tenure. So because of these issues, so I just I want to point out that you know again this isn't this isn't limited to us, and there are other are other counties facing this. And like I said, a neighboring county did run and successfully pass, which was was helpful for them. So I. I think that's important for the, the community to know that you know, we're, we're not the only ones to your sure, in this situation, right. and there are other counties who are successfully moving forward with some additional funding. I can speak to the, the drug epidemic a little bit, if that's all right. Sure, um, please. You know, I, I, I came into the, uh, the law in 1998 new drug, a couple years old, OxyContin is here, and we've seen this evolution. We all know it, so I'm not going to spend 20 minutes talking about it, but, but yes, yeah, fentanyl, and, and there's even some more powerful versions of fentanyl, fluorofentanyl, acetafentanyl. Um, every time we think we know what the biggest bang drug is on the market, it changes. China is manufacturing more and more of these kinds of drugs. They're getting over here for basically the open border we have in our southern states, uh, across our southern states, and through um, and through our ports. And uh, at the beginning of COVID um, and, and various policy changes, we've seen uh, where we were getting on our highways coming down. US 23 is a pipeline uh, to major cities, to, to um, uh, those cities like Huntington, Portsmouth, Charleston. Uh, Route 35 through Gallia County, they're experiencing the same thing. And we're seeing, um, instead of the grams where 10, 15 years ago, Sheriff, if I'm right, 20 some grams of cocaine or what have you was like, wow, huge hit. Well, we skipped ounces and now we're in pounds. We're seeing pounds come down our highways. And, and a lot of those now are not um, cut uh, in the, they're, they're still in the bricks with the, uh, the Mexican cartel stamp. I mean, so that's how much we're seeing. That's how much our law enforcement is dealing with here in Sida County, in Huntington, in Greenup, Kentucky, everywhere. And, and you are absolutely correct. It's not a Sida County problem. It's a national problem. And in a lot of ways, Sida County is ahead of that problem. Um, but it is, it is taxing our manpowers and our resources um, 
we can't wait on the state to come in and rescue us. It's, it's been kind of a thing in Portsmouth and Sayre County for a couple of years now. We gotta we gotta cinch up our boots and, and go to business. And um, and and so uh, you're correct. Fentanyl is the main thing. There's some there's some other drugs that are starting to come in the market. But what people where it's really bad is what is pervasive is somebody might think they're buying cocaine or heroin, and it's not. It's fentanyl. Uh, even some of our methamphetamine, which is the other major drug that we see, which isn't manufactured here anymore. It's going through the same uh, production channels that fentanyl is going through. Um, uh, we're seeing a purer version of methamphetamine, and sometimes that methamphetamine is laced with fentanyl. And, and you're talking about deadly things. The scary thing about that is if somebody is trying to do the right thing, and they get clean, and then they relapse, and they take their old hit of fentanyl, we're seeing a lot of deaths. And, and so, so you're absolutely right. Fentanyl, we've seen this exponential jump in problems. And, and, and it's, it, it's not even a trickle down. It's hit the children of these families uh, head on. And, and that's why the agency is working in 1980s laws. It's a, it's a square peg into a round hole. That's, that's it's a square peg into a round hole. You got, you know, 90 days might work to clean up a house that was dirty. It doesn't work to get people clean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I should ask this while you were standing. Do you, do you all feel that a major, and I, I can't put a percentage on this, do you think the majority of our problems, and I'm talking about children that are put in placement as a result of, okay, X, is a lot of that directly or indirectly associated with the opioid epidemic? Would that be a fair assessment? I see a lot of heads shaking yes. If you're not on camera right now, but I see a lot of heads shaking yes. Sheriff Thurman just joined us. Uh, would you agree with that assessment? That, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing this throughout the county. We Look, every, every other day we hear about CPS having to take custody of a child because of an opioid issue of some kind or, um, you know, uh, you know, just the other day, a, a, a suspected child rapist, you know, and I, I say that that way because, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty, but, but I mean, we're seeing a lot of uh, child-related crimes in our community, so it's a very big, big issue. Um, would, and let me ask this question, and, and Sheriff Thurman is with us, um, and, and the prosecutor can maybe speak to this as well, which I know you can't actually. Do you feel that our op opioid epidemic is getting better? That that the level of opioid abuse in our community is getting better? <laughs> See two notes. I believe that we have a great team in place with cooperation between uh, all of our agencies, the law enforcement agency, prosecutor's office, uh, your board. Uh, in providing the necessary resources and also the cooperation with uh, uh, children's services and job and family services uh, now. Uh, but uh, with our open borders that we have and the, the massive amounts of uh, drugs that are crossing our borders and coming into our communities, I believe that is only getting worse. Uh, we've added, uh, my office has added and working in conjunction with the other agencies added an, an additional drug task force or major crimes task force which is assisting uh, uh, prosecutor Tiemann's uh, special victims unit and the cooperation that we have with his office and the other agencies within uh, Soda County uh, are addressing those shortfalls and, and uh, doing what we can to protect the innocent. But uh, when you look at how long we have had the uh, the drug epidemic within our county and how much uh, parenting skills have uh, we have lost those because I mean the uh, the addiction and those people under addiction having uh, children and not being able to pass on those necessary skills which uh, contribute to the problem thank you thank you yeah, I, prosecutor team and 100%, I think, I think we're doing more with what we've got than yeah. we ever had before. I right. think there's more collaboration, um, but the problem's not going to go away. I mean, we've had crime since Cain and Abel, and uh, we're going to continue to have crime. And, yeah. 
And unfortunately, we haven't figured out a way to to uh, predict crime before it happens. That's just in the movies. So, it, um, but yeah, this the problem's not going to go away. Uh, these people that want to see this country degrade are not going to go away. Um, and and uh, addiction is not going to go away. Thank you. The reason I brought that up is because I'm very concerned that, you know, and we have mentioned this at the state level multiple times, we've talked with the governor, we've talked with our legislators, is that we are pouring millions and millions and millions of dollars into recovery. And I, as we do feel that that is important, our children are being left behind. Mm -hmm. They are in a big way. Um, again, even though we have seen increases in funding at the state level, we have, they've been modest increases. And we are still ranked at the bottom uh, of the 50 states as far as uh, children's initiatives, as far as funding for children. Um, our, our CPS, our, our John Family Services, uh, ODJFS, are, are severely underfunded right now. And this drug epidemic has, has taken it to a whole new level. So it, it's important that everybody understand that and in, in making their decisions. I think our children are our treasure and should be taken care of. Uh, we are all taxpayers in this room, so we don't take any of this lightly. Uh, we have talked about this for a while, and, and mistake, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but Children's Services has been operating in a deficit. Now, they had carryovers for a while. They did. But this, was, this, this signal was sounded, or this siren was sounded a long time ago, that the, the carryovers were being depleted because of the severity of the housing cost of what we was dealing with as far as numbers. And that dates back to the middle of 2020. Jason, if I'm not mistaken, we started seeing reductions in our carryover, according to the financial reports, then. So that siren, that, 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 that clarion call was going out by leadership, and, but we weren't seeing a reduction in the numbers because of the severity of the problem. And we're still dealing with that, and we're, we're, it's getting better. And as you heard today, citizens of Southern County need to understand it's getting better, but it's going to take time. It is going to take time. So I just, I wanted to draw all that out and the investment we've already given. My goodness, um, Saudi County's doing everything they could. The Special Victims Unit was just mentioned. That we're trying our best, along with the prosecutor, sheriff's office, and then their entire collaboration with other agencies, New Boston, Portsmouth, everybody under SVU, to battle the, the, the crimes against children and, and, and special victims, which covers a broad range of individuals. We're investing, we've invested, the Board, Board of County Commissioners invested, funded, you guys are working that hard um, in adding attorneys to children's services. That has been paid for, that has been added uh, to, to the prosecutor's office. Um, we used to be a, a .5 FTE on that, a, a part-time person, and, and now we're a two and a half. Uh, so there's been an investment there, so we're, we're doing our best, we're doing everything we could. We saw this coming. And that's, that feeds into the whole reorganization of, you know, of the structure, where we're at now, and here we are. And, and we, we've got to take all of this very seriously. Nobody likes more taxes, nobody. And trust me, we're working, you mentioned, and one of you mentioned it about, you know, we take it serious and we, we want to try to keep the cost as low as possible and everything else, and you're looking for ways, I think the word, uh, opportunities for improvements and things like that. And we are too. We're looking at other avenues, actually pretty extreme avenues to counter this, you know, to the taxpayers. We are actually working on that right now, and hopefully we can discuss that more uh, later on, the efforts by Commissioner Powell. But um, we, we just need everyone to understand the magnitude of the situation and to see it for what it is. All right, and I'll, I'll finish with that. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for thank your you. time. Thank you for your time. Any additional comments? Just listening to the conversation with our guest and um, and looking at the numbers since I've been here, um, you know, I it breaks my heart that we have you know nearly 400 children, 365 at, uh, at the most current count, and then the number of hours your caseworkers are putting in, um, it, it, it breaks my heart. It. But it tells me that this county is doing more than what they can 
to, to, to help the children. Um, when I used to hear the number, you know, when I first came in, there was not quite 200 in custody. And I've been here six years, and now it's almost 400. Um, those numbers, you know, when, I, when I used to think about it, it was just, I, I, I couldn't put my head around it. But the one thing that has become clear to me in the last um, six months, a year, is that <clears throat> all those, all those, the numbers are high. The hours they're working are, are enormous. But it, I mean, it just tells me how hard this county and your agencies are working. Uh, I know there are, there's a neighboring county that doesn't really, might as well say they, they do not do children's services uh, work. Uh, their, their, their children, the number of children in their custody is minimal. But that's not a good thing. That just tells me they're not doing the job this county is. So I want to thank each and every one of you for what you're doing, and hopefully we can we can make some changes for everyone that will help the help the employees, the agencies, the children as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. Um, I, I guess the last comment I will have on this is, you know, anytime you're talking about levies, there's going to be a knee-jerk reaction to try to make this a very political. Mm -hmm. Item, uh, this is not a Republican issue, this is not a Democratic issue, this is a children's issue, period. Um, and we often in this county talk about we need to be doing more for children, we need to be doing more for children. This is an opportunity to do just that. Um, we're fixing the processes, that's happening. You, you've heard some of what's already happened and there's you know, even more coming, but um, even, even if you clean up the backlog, once again, you know, even if we do get those 89 kids out of custody, we're still in the 200s, and you've already heard we have funding for 130. So there, there's uh, there's some math that just doesn't work here. So um, you know, I, I truly believe that the citizens of Soda County want to take care of children. Uh, I think that they will see the value in ensuring that our most vulnerable are taken care of. Um, also, at the same time, I'm very mindful that you know it is a it is a political football. And should, should a levy not go through, there's some very um, extreme steps that we as the Board of Commissioners will have to take because this is a mandated service that we provide to the children of this county. So that money has to come from somewhere. Um, and that comes from the general fund. To this point, we've been able to pay for it through ARPA funds, one-time money. Once that money is gone, it is gone. Um, if we have to make up, you know, several million dollars of uh, shortfall every year, um, I got two office holders sitting in the room with us right now. Um, you know, we have to look at everybody's budget. You know, we're going to be submitting budgets soon, and you know, part of me wonders, do we have to get two budgets? One, if this goes through, or two, what does it look like if it doesn't? That's the very real reality of what we're talking about here. Um, but I, I still believe that the, the citizens of Soda County um, want to take care of children, um, will support this initiative. Um, this vote today is not to put it on ballot, but rather to send down to the auditor's office to get a true number of what the millage will generate. Uh, this will be a topic, uh, once we get that documentation back, this will be a topic and a vote next week, uh, should it go on the ballot. Um, the reason we're talking about it now is there's a deadline of August 1st, or August, first week of August, I don't know what the date is. So that's why we're talking about it now for a November vote. Um, with that, um, can I get a motion for this resolution? I will make a motion to adopt the resolution. I'll second. Ms. Coleman? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Powell? Aye. And thank you all once again for your time. I know it's, yeah. but it's important that all this information is shared and people truly understand what's going on. It's not an overnight fix, but thank you for your continued effort uh, and quite honestly, you know, protecting our children. So thank you.